system. I welcome you all and it was uh, a good idea of our mothership as we call it <laughs> to uh, promote teeny TED talks. Um, this is the first one this year but we might have one again in February and uh, there's a lot of talent out there and it's just to showcase local talent. People who live here and have a great story to tell, or some such. So, um, oh. so welcome to the Tiny TED Talk. And our first speaker hails from way back east in uh, Massachusetts. He's been a captain on a, a crabbing uh, fish expedition many, many times. He uh, works here locally with the landscaping service and an all-around wonderful man. This is Tom Carney! She's my sister-in-law, so that's the only reason. <laughs> she got me up here. <laughs> I, uh, I started fishing commercially in 1972 and uh, I was a crazy young guy and I met some fishermen in, in Ballard. I had a kind of a successful flooring business, uh, but their trips to Alaska and their stories kind of excited me a little bit and I was bored with what I was doing so the call to Alaska got me and so I headed up to Dutch Harbor. With nothing to offer except the willingness to go to work. And uh, by the time I got up there, I had like $60 in my pocket. I couldn't turn around and come back if I wanted. And sometimes when people get as far as Cole Bay, which is a long ways from here, in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, up in the beginning of the Aleutian chain, skippers had talked their wives into coming up to Dutch Harbor and spending the winter there with them and waiting for them when they came back from fishing so they could go home and be with their wives. And some of the wives actually got as far as Cole Bay, got off the plane, because you have to take a small plane from Cole Bay to go to Dutch, and take a look around and start crying. <laughs> <laughs> Went back into the airport and booked the flight back to Seattle. <laughs> because they weren't going any further in that direction towards Dutch. So it's a pretty desolate com uh, country. There are no trees. This is a place called King Cove. I lived there with the Aleuts for five years. And uh, it was at the beginning of my career as a, a commercial fisherman and captain. And uh, it was kind of an exciting time of my life, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And to be up, up north in, a, in an environment like that, is uh, a challenge. And, but I made friends with the Aleuts and I hung around with them and they had a saying that when the tide is out, the table is set. You'll never go hungry. All you have to do is walk down and start picking things off the rocks to eat and there's always something to eat that's right there. Um, and so I really enjoyed learning a lot about the country from them and going on hunting expeditions with them. And, and uh, hunting season is 12 months out of the year, there's nobody to stop you from going hunting. And when, when the freezer starts to get low, you grab your rifle and a couple of buddies and a skiff and away you go. And you go hunting and you get food to bring back and put in your freezer. There's an island that's not that far from King Cove, probably about 50 miles. It's called Caton's Island. And uh, during the Second World War, uh, the, they needed to feed the troops in, in Dutch Harbor. And so our military managed to land a hundred head of cattle on this island called Caton's Island. And to this day, 
there's still cattle on that island. There's nothing else there, zero, but they've managed to live all these years on that island. And occasionally, we'd venture to that island and get a, a, a beef to take back and put in the freezer. The only trouble with that beef was there's not a lot to eat on that island. And so they'd go down to the shore and they'd eat seaweed. And so it would taint the meat a little bit and it would taste a little iodine. So we used that meat to mix with other meat to, you know, make it palatable. Um, but those adventures were pretty exciting. So this is King Cove and this is what it looks like uh, on a nice day. <laughs> Tell a story about the leaf. Windows. So, um, I was in a boat like this one here with the windows forward and the house forward. And uh, I rode an 86 foot boat into a 100 foot wave. And 20 feet of that wave was breaking. And we had taken another wave that wasn't quite so big over the bow and flooded basically the boats on the water uh, and flooded the boat outside. And I sent my engineer, who was with me in the pilot house, aft to look and make sure the decks were clearing. And right after that, we rode back down and back up the next wave. And I, the, the boat was at an angle approximately like this, totally in the wave, and the next 20 foot green water just breaking right over and took all the windows out of the front of the boat. The, uh, in a King Crab boat, you have two of everything. You have two radars, you have two big radios, when I say big radios, they're capable of reaching 3,000 miles. You have uh, two VHF, which is usually good for about 60 to 80 miles. Then you have a CB that's good for maybe 15 miles. And you have automatic pilot. You have, at that point in time, we had uh, LC Loran, and we had two Lorans, and everything was gone. The waves took everything. Took the, the scanners off the top of the house for the radar, took all the antennas off. There's a cowling that sticks out above the windows, about a foot and a half, that was bent straight down. You can see it hit the weight perfectly dead on. And, uh, and virtually, virtually crippled us. The only, th only way I knew where I was, because just before the wave hit, I looked at this little compass and we worked the boat from the starboard side, and then we call that our doghouse. We were always in there working the controls and watching the guys on deck and talking to them and watching the seas and running the boat from that particular spot. And I looked at uh, my compass and I saw what my heading was, and then I ducked. And it was like, like somebody hit the boat with a big sledgehammer. And it just reverberated, and the boat was totally in and under the wave and washing through the boat or into the boat. And uh, so we got everybody in survival suits, and uh, now I, I'm just, the wind is coming and hitting me right in the face, and I'm staring at nothing, and just, you know, looking for the next wave. And uh, we didn't have an automatic pilot. We didn't have any aid to navigation except for that, that compass. And we still had steering, and so I was working a jog stick and watching my rudder indicator and staying on course. And the rest of my guys did a pretty good job of making sure that uh, there was nothing floating around in the engine room that would cause problems and uh, keep us from losing power. As long as we had power, we had a chance. We lose power in that particular point in time and we would have been probably all, all over and done with. Uh, but I had a good crew and they, they did everything they were supposed to. They got in their survival suits and, uh, and uh, did their job. And I didn't have any radios except for that CB, but I was, I was fishing on the backside of the Bering Sea, which is the Shemigan Islands and the Pacific Ocean, and uh, so I was close to land. And I called the Mayday in, and the only radio that worked was the CB, and uh, for some reason, I have no idea, it skipped about 20 miles, and skipped over land, and there was this gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Hublet. I never knew his first name, but his son was Tommy Hublet, and he was a commercial fisherman. And his dad uh, was a crippled man, and he didn't have eyesight. Um, and his son bought him these radios, and that was his hobby. He would listen to the radios and monitor everything. That would be, you know, that was the way he did. And so he heard our May Day, 
and he woke everybody up in the house and he sent um, a family member down to the dock and uh, Babe Newman was in there with the uh, Lucian Princess, the nice big 127 foot boat. And they woke Babe up and uh, told him the Gale Marine. Uh, oh. Any questions, folks? Are you retired now? <laughs> Did you make it? <laughs> that was an emotional time. And then you went out again, yeah, right? Let me make it real short, but tell us a story about when you were Green Horn. What story is with, that? With a pair, you know? Oh. <laughs> I, I fell overboard, sorry. Oh dear. <laughs> Not a good thing to do. Um, I was a green horn, it was on a 165 foot boat, and uh, all our gear was kind of uh, mismatched. We had six foot pots, uh, seven foot, eight footers, and uh, we had to chain them down because they were so irregular. And uh, so there was a chain hanging, hanging out the scupper. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were finally getting through the last string of gear. And uh, we noticed that Pierre did. Pierre Johnson was my engineer. He had a big barrel chested suite and spoke broken English. When he got mad, you couldn't hardly understand him. Um, but anyway, uh, Pierre noticed that a row of parts had come loose from the rail. And me being the green one, I probably didn't tie the first part to the rail. And so all the rest of the parts were tied together. And so it was like a little freight train. And when the boat went like this, the whole row went, would slide across the deck and it'd slam into the rail on one side. And when the boat came back like this, it would slam into the rail on the other. So Pan points it out to me, he says, go tie that pot off. I says, all right. So I went and I grabbed this pot tie, put it around my neck, which is a half inch piece of nylon, about six feet long. Okay. And, uh, so I climb up over the stack, and I get on top of the stack, and I'm looking and trying to figure out how to do this. And there was no way I could stay and stand on deck and do it, because there was rows of pots, everything just right up against each other. So the only way I could figure out was I kind of climbed down, and I was able to put one leg inboard and one leg outboard. So I'm straddling, you know, like this, I'm straddling the rail, and the uh, row of pots come sliding, and I had already looped a clove hitch, and I just was waiting for the whole row to come to me, and now it's going to cinch it up to the rail. So everything worked just perfectly. The row of pots came and hit the rail, and I cinched up like this, and the pot tie broke in my hand. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing holding me, and into the water I went. And so the boat's going by, and I look up, and I see the chain hanging out the scupper, and I reached up and I grabbed the chain, and so I, I just held on. And I wasn't really intelligent. <laughs> and I figured that these guys are going to know I'm gone, and I'm going to have to scream and holler and shout. And I'm a new guy, and I didn't want to seem like a crybaby or anything, you know? <laughs> And so he just didn't say anything. And so I was riding along, <laughs> holding on to the boat, waiting for somebody to, fi to find me. And so I don't, time in situations like that, you know, how, how long was I there? You know, I don't know. But I decided that I was there too long. And the reason that they couldn't see me was because I was right up against the hull. So I figured I'm a good swimmer. And so I figured I'll just swim away from the boat, and they'll be able to see me, and then they'll, you know, pick me up out of there. So that was something I should never have done. I just let go of that chain. Um, but I did, and I swam away from the boat, and sure enough, uh, uh, this guy, Gene Dushkin, who was a uh, deckhand, comes over, he puts his hands on the rail, and he looks out, and he sees me in the water. And he's like, in shock, he didn't say anything. Well, Pierre sees Gene looking aft, and Pierre goes over and sees what, looks to see what Gene's looking at, and sees me in the water. So he, he calls his man overboard, and Skipper, you know, backs it down, and and uh, Pierre ran and grabbed the life frame we had, and he's all excited, you know. So rather than to take his time and throw it close to me, he just throws it. <laughs> <laughs> so it landed. 
probably from here to the other side of Chris, which isn't that far. But when I tried to swim from here to there, halfway there, I realized I was in trouble. I had all my rain gear on, my boots and everything else. And, uh, but I made it. And they pulled me out. And I didn't realize anything until I went into the stateroom and I took my clothes off and I looked at myself and I was blue and like purple. And hypothermia had already got this kind of stuff in the setting, I guess, I don't know. But I, I didn't really feel anything. That's a sign. So for, for pretty much the rest of the season, whenever we were in a bar, I didn't have to buy a drink. I was a stupid green one that fell overboard and was lucky enough to get fished back out again. So. How many rights do you have left? Yeah. <laughs> to, to my wife, none. <laughs> she won't let me go back out anymore. <laughs>